Amen. Thank you, worship team. This week I read about a consultant who was working with a group of college graduates. And he took all of these college graduates and he told them that there is one word that is used more than any other to describe this emerging generation as they're entering into the workforce. And that word begins with the letter E. And he asked these recent graduates, what do you think is that one word used to describe you that starts with the letter E? And all of these young hopefuls put their heads together and they begin answering, energetic, excellent, eager, enthusiastic, exceptional. We are exceptional. And after they listed all of these different E words describing how extraordinary they were. You see what I did there? The consultant said, actually, the number one most commonly used word to describe this generation as they move into the workforce is the word, what? Can you guess it? Entitled. Entitled. See, I already gave you the the sermon title for today. We're, We're talking about the entitlement trap. Today, So what exactly is entitlement? Let's go ahead and define our terms as we're getting started this morning. Entitlement is this mentality. It's a mindset based on the belief. And what we're going to discover is it's a false belief, but it's based on the belief that we deserve privileges or special treatment or that we have the inherent right to something. Simplified, it's this thinking that whatever it is, I deserve it. Whatever it is, I deserve it. I'm, I'm owed it. I should have it even if I didn't really earn it because, hey, I'm me. I'm exceptional, right? I mean, I deserve this. And not only that, I will punish, resent, or blame anyone or anything that stands in the way of getting what I think I deserve, of getting what I want. That's what entitlement is. Now, just by defining what entitlement is, I think we can easily see this mentality all over the place today, all through our culture today. This feeling or thought that I deserve better. I deserve more. I deserve it all. People should take care of me. I'm entitled to more than I'm getting. I have the right to everything that everyone else has. I just have that right. And I need us to understand today as we're getting started just how dangerous this self-focused, unrealistic, false, these, these expectations really are to our spiritual life. When I'm entitled, my life, my relationships, my circumstances are interpreted with self as the primary point of reference. It's all about me. I am the center of the universe. Everything else revolves around me. Actually, everyone exists to make me happy because I deserve it. Because I deserve it. Now, before we just kind of lay this problem at the feet of millennials, I can already feel it. The older generation, we're like, yeah, you young people. You millennials, we we like to pile on, don't we? What I need us to realize is that to one extent or another, all of us struggle with entitlement, with a sense of entitlement. We have to recognize that in ourselves today. this, 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 This idea, this mindset, I feel like everyone else, my friends, my life, just life itself, and especially God, they owe me something. Right? Do you, do you feel it in yourself today already before we've even gotten to the good stuff? I mean, this is, this is happening in our lives. I mean, I deserve a problem-free day, right? Don't I deserve a problem-free day? Don't, don't I deserve when I'm going into work to hit all green lights? I mean, those lights exist for me, right? I mean, I deserve that. Don't I deserve technology that always works? I can't believe The internet has been down for five minutes. I deserve technology that always works. Kids that don't annoy me. Right? Don't I deserve that? A body that never gets sick or tired. 
uh, uh, co-workers who serve me, who think I'm just the greatest thing ever. Uh, friends who appreciate me. Bosses who give me a raise every six months. I deserve it. Come on, church. <laughs> a nice car. A, a two-story house. Even though I'm only 25 and I'm already up to my deck, neck in school debt and I haven't really worked that long. But hey, everybody else is living at this standard of living. So I deserve it now. So I'm just going to go out and get it because I deserve it. A faster moving checkout line at the grocery store. A day off. No struggles. No challenges. Nothing but nonstop praise and good things. I deserve it. And when we don't get it, what happens? Our entitlement siren starts blaring, doesn't it? It's not fair. It's not fair. We're jealous. We're angry. We're resentful and ungrateful. Isn't it easy to see entitlement as a problem for others and not for ourselves? We can see the struggles that everybody else has. But we can't see what's happening in our own lives. I, I found a meme here recently that I think kind of sums up. It's a picture that's going to come up on the screen that, that really describes perfectly what we're talking about today. Going back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, right? That's me on my way to point out the speck in somebody else's eye. Right? When I can't see the log in my own eye. Jesus had it right, didn't he, in Matthew chapter 7? We... we let me point out that speck in your eye. And meanwhile, look, look what's hanging out the back of my minivan. <laughs> right? But that's so easy for us to fall into this trap, right? I can see your entitlement, but I can't see my own. I can point out yours, but what about mine? So let's focus on ourselves today. All of us struggle with this to one extent or another. And, and here's the problem. It's subtle. And it's dangerous. It's a modern day idol. I want us to think about it. An idol is anything that I center my life on that isn't God. That's what an idol is. And in this case, I'm centering myself on myself. It's me. The universe revolves around me. And so I have become my own worst enemy. Entitlement is a modern day idol. So what I want us to do today is to talk about what the entitlement trap looks like and how we can avoid it, how we can escape it if we're caught in this trap. And I want to show you from a story in the New Testament found in Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells a story of a father who illustrates God and he has two sons. He has an older son and he has a younger son. And we can see, I want us to be able to see the entitlement mentality in both of these sons' lives. It's actually going to be kind of a different take for us today on a very familiar story. We want to, we want to look for the entitlement mentality in these sons' lives. Let's start with the younger son, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 13. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now. Before you die. Now think about it. When does the inheritance normally come? After someone passes away. But this younger son is, hey, I want it now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Now, we see right away that this younger son's attitude towards his father is one-sided and self-centered. How do I know that? Because he assumed that part of the estate belonged to him when it really still belonged to the father. The father worked for it. The father had, had worked and earned what he had, yet the son believed it belonged to him. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. And that's the first entitlement mindset that I want us to think about today. I want it now. I want it now. That's, that's a struggle for a lot of us, isn't it? If you have a structured settlement and you need cash now, who do you call? J.G. Wentworth, 877-CASH-NOW. 
whatever you need. I, I want it now. I need it now. Thanks, Jordan, for, for helping me with that on Friday. He gave me that idea. <laughs> Traditionally, you receive your inheritance after someone dies, but not this guy. I, I want it now. I want to go and live my life. I don't want your rules. I don't want to wait. I want what you have and what you've worked for, and I want it now. So see, I hope we can see it's not just a millennial problem. It was a first centurion problem, whatever they called those kids from the first century. It, it was a problem then as well. I need it now. I want it now. So the father, for whatever reason, gives it to the son. And what does the son do? He goes out and he squanders it. He blows it. He wastes it. He, he, he blew it all on keg parties and prostitutes. And what took the father years or even decades to accumulate, this ungrateful son totally wasted in a matter of weeks or months. It's gone. It's all gone. I think the takeaway for us as we're looking at this younger son, too often we think that God is only in our lives to wait on us hand and foot. We just take him for granted, don't we? He should always be there to do what I want, when I want it, and how I want it. And by the way, I want it right now. Why aren't you doing it right now? And if there's any delay, I become angry that God isn't giving me what I believe should be mine. Why is God letting this happen to me? Why, why are you allowing this to happen? And we blame him for any stress or problems or pressure we're experiencing. Think about it. What are our motives at this point? This is, that doesn't sound like a love relationship, does it? It sounds like we're using God. Like the younger son, we think we know better than God. How dare us? We think we know better than God. Give me what you owe me. And now, I'm not interested in a relationship with the Father. I'm interested in my immediate gratification. What can you do for me, give me, that can serve my own pursuits? And God has got to be up there shaking his head. But child, I'm the source of your life. I, I, I'm, I am your satisfaction. Your purpose is found in me this is where your spiritual growth is found. Come and walk with me and know me and experience me. No, you're not interested in that? Okay, then here you go. Go and try it your way. Go, go and do it your way. And what happens? This younger son hits rock bottom, doesn't he? He was hungry and he was humbled. In his pursuit of what he wanted now. Yet rather than continue to wallow in his misery. He chooses to return to the father. Verse 17 says that he finally comes to his senses. But sadly he had to hit rock bottom first. Let's pick up in verse 20. First part of verse 20, it says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Let's pause there. You're the father and you see this son coming home who has squandered everything that you worked for. How are you going to react to this, to this son? Yeah, I already see some, a finger wagging out there, right? Is it going to be anger, disappointment, judgment? I told you so. Let's see how this father responds who, in this story, actually represents our heavenly father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son. He ran to his son and he wrapped his arms around him and he embraced him and he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father... I have sinned against both heaven and you. Can you feel the repentance in his heart? I am no longer worthy of being called your son. I bring nothing. I deserve nothing. I'm throwing myself completely at the mercy of you, Father. And his father says, quick. Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. 
get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we've been fattening. Steaks for everybody. We are going to celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. The celebration began. His son was home. There's good news for us today. Those of us who were called up in this entitlement trap. And that hope is the gospel. That hope is found in the gospel. The truth is, God doesn't owe us anything. You know what we deserve? Do you know what we deserve for our sin and our rebellion against holy God? We deserve death and we deserve judgment and we deserve hell. We don't deserve anything. But in his great love and mercy, God has given us everything through his son, Jesus. Everything through the blood of of his innocent son, Jesus. Mercy and grace and forgiveness and restoration and freedom from the penalty of sin. What we deserved ourselves, the penalty was paid at Calvary and the power of sin to destroy our lives, to separate us from the Father. Through the blood of Jesus, we have been reconciled, brought back into right relationship with our Father in heaven. The father in our story, just like God, wanted his son back. That's all he wanted. I just want my my son back. I don't want you to love me for what I can do for you. I have given you everything through my son, Jesus. I want you to experience the joy and the satisfaction of knowing me. And he welcomes us with open arms. There's hope for us. There's hope for all of us. Now, if you're familiar with this story, the older son and the brother hears something happening in the house. He's out in the fields working and he hears this celebration that's going on. He hears the music and he hears the dancing. And one of the servants tells him that his brother is home and he is not happy at all about what's happening. He's outside going, wait a minute. I've never broken the rules and nobody ever once did that for me. I deserve that, what's going on in there. I deserve that and more. And this is the second entitlement mentality that I want us to think about today. I deserve more. I deserve more. Here's how the story plays out in Luke chapter 15, 28 and 29. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go. He wouldn't even go in the house. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. This older brother had every luxury and benefit That you could want from a wealthy father. In addition to an inheritance that was waiting for him. Yet in his mind. He's a victim. He's a victim. He's he's caught up in the victim mentality. Somebody owes me. I deserve better. I deserve more dad. I deserve more. Does that sound familiar to any of us? Do any of us struggle with that? I I deserve what other people have. I deserve a better paying job. If I can't get a better paying job, I just don't want to work. I'd rather do nothing if I can't get the job that I deserve. I deserve these benefits. I deserve a vacation. Look how hard I'm working. You won't give me what I want? I'll just quiet quit. Anybody heard of that phenomenon? Quiet quitting? I'll show up, but guess what you're going to get from me? Minimum effort. That's all you're going to get from me. I'll show you. No effort. And we're angry. Like the older son, we're angry and we're bitter. There's a great great quote that I read this week about entitlement. It said, when we're entitled, we no longer view God and other people as relationships. Instead, we see them as targets and obstacles to blame 
for why we aren't experiencing more happiness and joy. No longer relationships, they're just targets and obstacles that we're blaming. You're getting in the way of my happiness, of what I deserve. I don't even care about you anymore. I don't even see you as a person anymore. You're a target. You're an obstacle. It's your fault that I'm not getting what I deserve. And the older son was resentful. He was bitter towards his father. He kept a record of all of the nevers that he was holding against his father. Does that sound like love? We know that love keeps no record of wrongs. Yet he's got his long list of nevers that he was just waiting to lay at the feet of the father. His father had never thrown a party for him. That intonation, have you ever used that? Nobody's ever done that for me. You've never thrown a party for me. You've never given me a goat to celebrate with my friends. Even though I have never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to do. It's not fair. The sirens are blaring. It's not fair. I deserve that and more. The older son remained physically present at home. But he missed out on a relationship with his father. He missed out. He was isolated and bitter in his heart. And all the while his father is thinking. Ev son. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's been here the whole time. It's all yours. I'm not interested in what you can do for me. I just want you to be with me. And you've chosen to see me in a different light. As an obstacle for what you want. The sad truth is entitlement fuels bitterness that leads me to be relationally isolated. I isolate myself. You're not giving me what I think I deserve so I cut myself off. All of a sudden now you're the enemy. You're the enemy. So what happens now? Now that you're the enemy, I complain about you. I gossip about you. I'm never happy and I'm always dissatisfied. Does that sound like the abundant life that God has for us? I mean, this is the opposite of the heart of God and who we are to be as his followers. It's the complete opposite so rather than holding on to the bitterness, this victim mentality in our lives, you know what we can do? We can choose humility and gratitude. We can choose love and to value the relationships that we have. But we've got to make the choice. We can stay where we are or we can make the choice to become the people that Jesus has for us to be. So I want to ask you this morning, are you entitled? Are you caught in the trap? Here are a few diagnostic questions to help us as we're thinking. Do I often feel discontent? And let, let the Holy Spirit speak to us this morning. Do I often feel discontent? Am I complaining a lot? Do I feel envy or resentment over the blessings that others seem to have? Do I look at life and say, this is not enough? This isn't enough. Am I disappointed with life, always living in a state of, I wish, I want, if I only had? You ever feel that way? Do I doubt God's faithful provision for me? Do I often unfavorably compare myself and my situation with that of others? How angry are you? Anger is oftentimes a, a telltale sign of entitlement. When you face obstacles, stress, and pressure, do you become mad and resentful? Or do you choose humility by relying on God more to grow through those challenges? Do you get angry because someone or something isn't making your life easier? Things aren't working out the way that you believe you deserve or expected. Or do you choose to learn, pray, and pursue understanding of what you can do to change? 
How do we go from being entitled to grateful? How do we choose spiritual growth over bitterness and resentment? Don't we want that? Don't we want what God has for us? Like Ray said just a couple weeks ago, you know where this all starts, where the battle is taking place? It's in our minds. The battlefield is in our minds. And so the first thing that we have to do is we have to shift our focus. Listen, if this, if this is how we're feeling all the time, I never have enough. I never will. I want it now. I deserve more. If your focus stays on yourself, entitlement is only going to gain more and more of a chokehold in your life. So what we've got to do, it's, it's a simple step, yet a difficult step, is to stop focusing on ourselves and shift our focus, where? To God. The focus off of ourselves and onto God. That's what gratitude actually does. It takes the focus off of ourselves and onto Him, the giver of all good things. I love how Matthew chapter 6, 6 is paraphrased in the message. Jesus is speaking and he says, here's what I want you to do in Matthew 6, 6 in the message. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Don't you love that? Drop the pretense. Drop the fake in it. Find a quiet place and be real with God. Be raw and be real with God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. I love this last part. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. Just in his presence. Like these younger, the older and younger son. It's, it's not what you can do for me. I don't want you to come to me what, what, and just use me. I want to be with you. I want you to come and sit with me and know me and feel me and let my grace and mercy wash over you. Do you know what the antidote to entitlement is? It's the gospel. It's, it's resting and soaking in the grace and the mercy of Jesus. When we truly cherish the gospel, when we are overwhelmed daily in the presence of God by his undeserved favor. You know, that's what grace is. Completely undeserved favor. When we're overwhelmed by his grace, what does that lead to? Gratitude and thanks and worship. There's a song that has really spoken to me recently, and I want to challenge you this week, along with the 21-day challenge that we're doing, to use this song in your quiet time. If, if, if worship songs are your thing, uh, I want you to find the lyric video on YouTube, and I want you to worship to this song. It's called Greater Still by Brandon Lake. Let me share with you some of the lyrics from this song. He sings, you met me at my lowest point. You saw me at my very worst. And when I expected disappointment, just like that younger son, this is my worst. This is my ugliest God. I'm dropping the, the role playing. I'm dropping the pretense. This is the ugly truth. This is the worst. I'm expecting disappointment. And love is all I hear. Love was all I heard. My sin was deep. Absolutely. I'm repenting. I've sinned against heaven and against you. My sin was deep, but your grace was deeper. My shame was wide, but your arms are wider. My guilt was great, but your love was greater still. You ran to me when I was naked and clothed me in your righteousness. You pulled me from the depths of darkness into your light again. My sin was so deep, but your grace was deeper. My shame was wide, but your arms were wider. My guilt was great, but your love was greater still. How deep, how wide, how far, how high the love of my Savior, the love of Christ. Let the gospel wash over you this week. 
And in that grace and mercy that is completely undeserved, your heart's going to turn to gratitude. Your, sh- your focus is going to shift from yourself to this unbelievable father who just wants you to know him and be with him and learn from him and walk with him. The gospel leads us to gratitude. Here's our second action step this morning. This is a tough one for us. Stop complaining. We don't want to hear that one, do we? Stop complaining and start being grateful. Stop complaining. Avoid complaining at all costs. You know, that's our challenge, our day seven challenge. If those of you who are doing, how, how's that going? For some of us, that was yesterday. It depends on when you started. For some of us, that was yesterday. For some of us, it's today. We've been awake for a couple of hours. How is your co- not complaining for one day going so far? It's hard, isn't it? When we're aware of something like that, we realize just how much of our minds, our thoughts, our words are consumed with the negative, with complaining, with gossiping, with with negativity. Gratitude is so important because not only does it focus our attention on God, but it focuses us on the positive on the positive things, the good things. And we think that complaining is not that big a deal, don't we? Of all the stuff, come on, Don, this this is the small stuff. This is inconsequential, and they deserve it. I mean, I should be able to just vent and and complain about how I'm feeling, right? That's good, isn't it? I, I mean, they deserve it. But in reality, we've said this before, referencing the, the nation of Israel, grumbling is a rejection of God's grace. It's a rejection of his goodness, his provision, and his sovereign plan in our lives. We know better than God. That's why we can complain, because I know better, and I would do it differently, and so this is the way it should be. God, you must be, I don't know, what are you thinking? And we're saying, God, you don't know how to take care of me. That's what we're in essence saying. You don't know how to take care of us. So grumbling and complaining are serious. They are barriers to gratitude. We're not looking at the world through the lens or the memory of what God has done for us from the perspective of faith in his promises, only the feelings of right now. That's what's happening. The feelings of right now. I deserve this. I want it now. I can't even see all the blessings that you've given me. My focus is only on that one thing. That one thing that is perceived as a bad thing, right? That one perceived bad thing in my life, which leads to the conclusion, God, you're not good. I've totally forgotten about all the other blessings, but I'm just focused on this one negative thing. And so I say, God, you're not good. And that is unfair and that is untrue about who God is. Nothing turns us into bitter selfish, dissatisfied people more quickly than ungratefulness, complaining, focusing on what we don't have instead of who we have. But here's the good news. On the other hand, nothing will do more to restore contentment and the joy of our salvation more than a true spirit of gratefulness and thankfulness. So that's what we want to do. We want to stop complaining and start being grateful for God's provision for people in our lives. We want to stop and count our blessings. We want to take our eyes off of what we don't have, what others have, and keep them focused on God and his provision. Over and over, research shows us that being thankful is actually good for your health. This is, this is secular science. Clinical trials indicate that the practice of gratitude can have dramatic and lasting effects in a person's life. Let me just share a few benefits of gratitude. It can lower your blood pressure, improve immune function, and facilitate more efficient sleep. Another researcher found that thankful people showed better well-being, a less depressed mood, less fatigue, less inflammation, healthier heart rhythms, and better sleep. Stress hormones like cortisol are 23% lower and grateful people. 
A U.S. News and World Report article said people who made a daily and or frequent habit of being thankful were not only more joyful, they were healthier, less stressed, more optimistic, and more likely to help others. Why would we choose complaining over gratefulness? <laughs> Why in the world would we do that? When being thankful is the best way to live. It's the best way to live. Jesus wants us to live abundant lives. So stop complaining, not just one day, not just on day seven of a gratitude challenge, but make this the challenge every day. I'm not going to complain today. I'm not going to focus on the negative, on, on that one perceived bad thing. I'm going to recognize all of the good things, all of the provision, all of the blessings, and I'm going to choose gratefulness today. It's the best way to live. Finally, our last action step today. Stop comparing and coveting and start learning contentment. That's a lot of C words, isn't it? Stop comparing and coveting and start learning contentment. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in chapter 4 verse 11 that he had learned to be content in whatever the circumstance was, in in. Any and every situation, whether he was well-fed or hungry, whether he was rich or poor, he had learned to be content. So what does that tell us? Contentment does not come naturally to us. The flesh is going to resist contentment. So we have to train our hearts and our minds and our attitudes to be content. We've got to learn it. And to learn it, we've got to go through it. But we've got a spiritual enemy, don't we? And he tries to steal our contentment two ways. By us comparing and by us coveting, envying, wanting what other people have. The green-eyed monster. That's how he comes at us. Didn't that what happened in the garden? Adam and Eve are in paradise. They have Every blessing in all of creation to enjoy. And Satan comes and he whispers in their ear and he says, he takes their eyes off of everything that they have and he focuses it on that one thing that God told them not to do. Isn't that amazing? We're in paradise and my focus has shifted from all the blessings to, I wonder about that one thing God told me not to do. How is he holding out on me? And they fall into the trap. They fall into the trap. And we do too. We, we covet. We envy. I want what someone else has. So what do we do? We run up credit card debt. We leave our spouses because we deserve happiness. We covet. We compare with others. Isn't it a competition? Isn't, isn't comparison just a competition? That's all it is. I have to keep up in order to look successful and to be happy. If you're going to respect me, I've got to have what you have and more. Always wishing my life was different, wanting more. But the truth is my stuff is really okay until I start comparing it with what you have, what other people have, when I start comparing it to the latest and newest stuff. See, my countertops were fine until I walked in your house and saw your granite countertops. All right? My car got me from point A to point B just fine, but then I sat in your new Lexus with leather interior, and whew, all of a sudden, now, I'm not so content anymore. Right? Truth is, my stuff's fine. It's God's provision in my life. I should be thankful, but I start comparing. I start coveting, and I'm not grateful anymore. I'm not content anymore. So maybe it's time for us to get off Facebook and Instagram, stop looking what everybody else has and begin to recognize how blessed we are. All that he has blessed us with. We've got basically two ways that we can approach life. Never be satisfied, never be content, focus on our limited resources, what we don't have, and spend our lives pursuing more and more and more and more. To keep Keeping this entitlement trap, I want it now, I deserve more. Or like Paul, we can learn to be content.
We can say, Jesus, I don't want this anymore. I want to learn to be content regardless of our circumstances. I want to focus on the glorious riches, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms that have been given to us through Jesus Christ. We've got it all, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. So we should be thankful. Paul could be content even when he had nothing because in Jesus he had everything. That came from the great theologian Ray several months ago. He could be thankful with nothing because in Jesus he has everything. See, the focus isn't on himself. The focus is on Jesus. we got to shift our focus and stop complaining and start being thankful Stop coveting and comparing and learn contentment. Get your eyes refocused on all that you do have. All that God has chosen to give you. He's the giver of all good things. Trust his plan. Trust his provision. What we have is enough. Who he is is enough in our lives. How do I do that? How do I do that? Paul tells us the secret. Philippians 4.13, you can do it all through Christ who gives you strength. So come and rest in his presence. It takes us all the way back. Come and be with him and allow his presence to shift your focus off yourself to him. Let that grace and mercy and the gospel wash over you. You can't help but praise him and thank him and worship him. The benefits are amazing. Gratitude reorients us spiritually. It brings peace. It fosters contentment. It builds our faith. It defies Satan's lies. It invites joy. It guards against envy. It improves our health. And it rescues us from the entitlement trap. Let me pray for us today that we will be just a more grateful people.